Okay, everyone, you know the drill. No fluff. Let's get started studying. If your phone is around, if your iPad is around, here's what you do with them. Yeah, throw them away, unless, of course, you're watching this on your phone, in which case, don't throw it away. All right, let's get started with 4.1, plate tectonics. Okay, with plate tectonics, we're first going to talk about the layers of the earth. Yep, back in elementary school. So first, we're going to talk about the layers of the earth with their chemical properties. And so there are three layers there, the crust, the mantle, and the core. Why are they separated? Because they have different chemical properties. Let's dig into it. So for the crust, we have solid rock. It's made up of oxygen and silicon, while the mantle is made up of molten magma. The core is made up of nickel and iron. Now, it's important to know that there are two types of crust. There's continental crust. It is thicker and it is less dense. And there's oceanic crust. It is thinner, but it is more dense, which means whenever subduction happens, which we'll talk about later, the oceanic cr uh, plate crust goes underneath the continental because it's more dense. But now let's talk about the physical properties and how those layers of the earth work. All right. So for physical properties, we have the lithosphere. The lithosphere has um, the crust and a little part of the mantle as well. It's the top layer. Right underneath the lithosphere, we have the stenosphere, and the stenosphere is actually made of semi-molten ductile rock, which means it's flexible rock. Like if you held it in your hand, you would be able to bend it. Right under that is the mesosphere, and meso means middle, so hopefully that'll help you remember it. And it is fluid. It is liquid. Under that, we have two parts, the outer core, which is fluid. It is liquid. You could drink it, except you would die. And the inner core, which is solid iron. It's very dense and it's solid. Okay. And so this is how you characterize them based on their physical properties, which is basically, you know, if they're solid, liquid, whatnot. And so just to review for physical properties, we have the crust, mantle, and core. The crust is solid rock. Mantle is molten magma, which means it's kind of liquid. Um, and then the outer core we have is liquid, fluid, inner core, solid. And then physical properties, we have the lithosphere, asthenosphere, mesosphere, outer core, inner core. All right. There's still more. <laughs> okay. Next, we're going to talk about a vocab word, and this is hotspots. Hotspots is where molten material from the mantle reaches the lithosphere. So um, molten material reaches the lithosphere, which again, if you remember, it's the crust and a little bit of the mantle, and so it's the outermost part. Those are hotspots. Something else really important to note is mantle convection. What is mantle convection? It basically is the circulation of different things. And um, the circulation of things in the mantle actually is what causes plate tectonics. So now let's move on to the theory of plate tectonics. What is it? It is at Earth's lithosphere, which, if you remember, is the topmost layer, is divided into plates that are constantly moving. And again, we kind of talked about this oceanic plates going to be under the sea, continental plates under the land. Makes logical sense. Okay, now let's talk about the different boundaries that form because of the different plate tectonics. So I want you to imagine that two boundaries are crashing against each other. Boom. Do you know what that's called? Well, if you said convergent, then you are correct. That would be a convergent plate boundary. And something important to note with convergent boundaries is that this thing called subduction happens. Subduction is where one of them goes under, another goes upper. And if you remember from earlier in this video, we just talked about what goes under, and that's the oceanic crust because the oceanic 
crust or plate is actually more dense, and so it's going to sink, while the continental crust is going to rise. So now you know what convergent boundaries are. What do they form when the plates go like this? They form volcanic mountains, island arcs, and trenches. Know those, and you're good to go with convergent. Now let's talk about different type. We're going to talk about divergent. Yeah, exactly. So these plate boundaries, they're splitting up. They're diverging. They're divorcing. They're going away from each other. And what happens here? Whenever they diverge, this interesting thing happens called seafloor spreading. Seafloor spreading happens when we have diverging plates. And so as oceanic plates move apart... Rising magma forms new oceanic crust on the seafloor. So basically, the plates are moving apart, and so there's a gap in the crust. And so the mantle spews out magma, and this magma cools, and then it creates new seafloor, seafloor spreading. And so what do these divergent plate boundaries create? They create ridges and valleys. This last type is probably the easiest, in my opinion, um, easier than the other two, and that is going to be transform boundaries. And so that is when um, there are two moving side to side. So they're just minding their own business. They're moving side to side, and something happens as these plates move side to side against each other. Like they don't face each other. They don't diverge. They, they're moving side to side. And what is it that happens that when this happens? An earthquake. So let's talk about earthquakes for just a second. Here's what is important about earthquakes for this exam. All right. So first, you need to know what magnitude means. It means the severity of an earthquake. Magnitude, severity makes sense. Next, you need to know what amplitude of an earthquake means. Amplitude is like the height, height of the seismic wave created because of the earthquake. Think of amplitude as just like the height of the wave created. And the Richter scale is a scale meant to measure the strength of an earthquake. So an earthquake with a Richter scale of like one, probably not very dangerous. 10? Wow. How are we not extinct? Um, and then whenever we have earthquakes of a high scale, tsunamis can also happen whenever earthquake displaces water because then, you know, now there's water also out to get us. And so everyone, that was it for 4.1. Next up, 4.2 for soil formation and erosion. So this is actually really simple. How does rock form? Well, whenever magma from the Earth's inside reaches the surface, it cools, the magma cools, and it hardens, and it forms rock. And there are three key ways in which um, rocks form, and you already know what they're called afterwards, igneous, sedimentary, metamorphic. But how are they formed? Well, the first way that rock can be formed is directly from the molten magma. So let's say the magma spewed out and lands on the surface and it cools and it crystallizes. That would be igneous. Magma cools. That's it. Pretty simple. Next, two, the compression of sediments. So Let's see, uh, materials deposited by wind, water, glaciers over time are just compressed into sedimentation. That would be sedimentary rock. The third is exposure of rocks and other earth materials to high temperatures and pressures. So let's say something was put under a lot of pressure, um, maybe it becomes a diamond, becomes some sort of rock as a lot of pressure is applied to it. That would be metamorphic. It undergoes a metamorphosis, if you will, and it changes into a rock. And so really simple, igneous, magma, cools, sedimentary, sediments are compressed, metamorphic, high temperatures and uh, pressures metamorphosize this rock into metamorphic rock. Now, something important to note here is with sedimentary rock, 
layers of sediment are actually um, known as a fossil record. So over time, the sediments are compressed. But if we actually look at the different layers, we're able to tell what um, what how old that rock is or how old something is because of the fossil record, because there are fossils within that sedimentary rock that we can then do carbon dating on, things like that. So you'll be able to tell the age of these rocks and these fossils because of sedimentary rock. Now let's talk about something I feel like I used to hear all the time in elementary school, but I still don't exactly know the difference between. So weathering and erosion. So weathering is when this happens. This was a rock. This was a rock. And over time, I broke it down. I'm weathering the rock right now. Wow, I'm really bad at it too. Anyway, I'm weathering the rock. That's what I'm doing. Let's say I moved it. I was like, oh, that is called erosion. Moving it. Now I deposit it. Deposition. So let's go a little more specific. Whenever I was breaking down this rock, what are the different types of weathering? Well, there's physical weathering, which is kind of what I was doing here except it looks differently because this is not a rock. So physical weathering, there are three types. First is from organic activity. So whenever plants grow and it loosens soil, or whenever like people or animals move around and we move soil and we break things down while we stomp on the soil or the rock, that is weathering. Two, root wedging. So let's say that um, in cement or in, in a rock somehow, a plant find a way to grow and then it breaks it apart because it grows in the middle of the plant or grows in the middle of the rock. That would be root wedging. The roots break it apart as the plant grows inside. Three, ice wedging. So as glaciers move, they scrape against a mountain and this breaks down the rock. Those are all ways it's physical weathering. I'm breaking down the rock physically or with a mechanical breakdown. That whenever chemical weathering happens, which is just the breakdown of rocks by chemical reactions, um, let's say like acid was poured on the rock for whatever reason, there's a reaction, it, it was broken down somehow. Common locations where chemical weathering takes place is where areas where there's lots of water. So if there's humidity, there's lots of lakes, warmer and wetter are going to be places where um, chemical weathering really thrives. Okay, let's talk a little bit about erosion. Like we said, this would just be like the moving of that broken down rock because of wind, water, ice, living animals. Could be many reasons for it. Next, there's deposition. That is actually the accumulation and the depositing of the eroded material. Like, let's say um, there's a lot of sediment. It accumulates over time. It's like deposited in the same place deposition. It's deposited. It's moved somewhere else. All right. And guys, I think that was it for 4.2. <laughs> okay. So now we are back for 4.3, soil composition and properties. Don't click off this video. Keep watching. Let's finish this. I'm sleepy too, but you can do this. All right. So let's talk about what soil is. What is soil? It's just a mix of mineral and organic components. Why is it important? A couple of reasons you might need to know this for an FRQ. One, it's a medium for plant growth. Two, it filters water. Three, it filters air pollution. And four, it provides habitat. Five, it recycles organic matter. Um, think about things being decomposed in the soil, for example, um, or just nutrients being recycled in soil. Now let's talk about the factors that determine the properties of soil. A couple of things, the parent, which we'll talk about in a moment, the climate, topography, organisms, time. None of this matters that much um, other than the parent, in my opinion. So let's just go over each of them. Parent is the rock material beneath the soil. So it's the bedrock. It's, it's the parent. It's what started it all. Um, and so let me give you an example. The parent is important because it'll determine nutrient levels. So with quartz sand, it would be nutrient poor soil. With 
calcium um, CO3 carbonate, we'd have great soil, amazing nutrients. So the parent really matters in terms of the nutrients or that the soil has. Next, climate. So generally, higher latitudes and higher temperatures is better for soil. It's more moist. It's just better. Topography. What does that even mean? Well, steep soils, uh, see, say, steep slopes are bad because of erosion. With a steep slope, you can easily start eroding the steep slope. Um, but if you have a level field, then that's perfect. Next, organisms. Plants remove nutrients from the soil. So, so if there's more plants, it might mean it actually has less nutrients in the soil. Lastly, time. Generally, over time, you get better soil because there's more of accumulation of nutrients. Okay, now let's talk about soil porosity. Porosity. I'm not sure how to say it, but it basically just means how quickly the soil drains. Let me give you an example. If I just held my hand up and I poured water, it would drain pretty easily. And so my hand is kind of like sand because sand is easily lets things through, has a low porosity. It easily lets the water drain through. However, let's say I had cement in front of me or a cup and I poured water in the cup. Well, the water isn't draining out. In this case, clay would be like the water in the cup. So for porosity, here you go. Highest porosity is clay, medium, silt. Silt is always medium. Sand, lowest. So clay will hold things, won't let the water drain away, whereas the um, sand will let things drain away. Now let's talk about the size of the soil types. So generally speaking, even though clay is tougher, it holds more, it's the smallest particle, while sand is the largest. So sand, largest, silt, once again, the middle child, I'm sorry. And then we have clay, the smallest. That's why it's so tough. Right? It's small and it's tough. It doesn't let the water get through. Think about it that way. Here's a vocab word for you. Loam. So loam is just a mixture of different soil types, but they actually have found that there is a specific really optimized soil type. And for agriculture, loam is it. If you have 40% sand, 40% silt, and 20% clay, loam... <laughs> Um, then you will have pretty much the best soil type for agriculture to grow. And so that's something important to know. It's just a mixture of all the textures. And the reason it's so great is because it is the perfect blend of the sizes, of the porosity, everything. And so that's important for you to know. It might be a multiple choice question.